Um, this is the first part of two screencasts on Fanny Ferns, the text that we read, which were Hungry Husbands, Milk Criticism on Ladies Books, and A Law More Nice Than Just. And before I talk about these texts, um, I want to just kind of point out that you know, I have a lot of admiration for, um, for Fanny Fern and, um, you know, being a single mom myself, I had, uh, you know, at a time in it where it had to have just been incredibly difficult for her to, um, you know, kind of leave, uh, uh, one of her husbands, her first husband died, um, uh, and, um, the second husband that she married was kind of a, abusive and just a jerk, I guess, all around. Um, but going against, you know, her family's belief system and their, um, you know, strong religious values. And here she was, you know, up and, and leaving with her two young daughters. Um, she'd been through so much. Um, and so you have to kind of have some admiration for this woman and her ability to um, be critical of men um, and their, because um, that's what these three texts really are, um, critical of men uh, and their viewpoint on a woman and woman's abilities and what she could do and still be really funny uh, and enjoyable. These are all, these three reads are so enjoyable um, to, uh, she just has such a great sense of humor, but they really were very groundbreaking, um, and it really opened up a lot of doors for women writers in America. You know, today we've come a long way, um, in concerning women's rights and, uh, gender inequality, and, it, and it's really, it really starts with, you know, some of the women that we have studied in 102. Uh, and 201, I'm sorry, um, with, uh, Judith Sergeant Murray and, um, and here with Fanny Fern, um, because it's, it's their, you know, they were kind of the, the groundbreakers or the front runners in, in, in women's equality. Um, and so I, I have a lot of admiration for, uh, for her. Um, and so I want to take on, uh, the first one, which is Hungry Husbands, which to me is just, is super, is super funny. Um, but it's also like considering, you know, and you would kind of try not to be a little biased against men and that's not where I'm trying to go. But, um, you know, basically this is, her um her idea that cooking is the way to win a man's heart it doesn't matter how grumpy or how ornery or how difficult they are you fill them up you fill up their bellies and uh you will you can win them over and get them to do whatever you want them to do um and so she starts with saying the straightest road to a man's heart is through his palate he is never so amiable as when he is discussed a roast turkey then's your time she says uh, to ask for half of his kingdom in the shape of a new bonnet, cap, shawl, or dress. Uh, he's too complacent to dispute the matter. And why stop there? Strike while the iron's hot. Petition for a trip to Niagara, Saratoga, the Mammoth Cave, the White Mountains, or to London, Rome, and Paris. Then should he demur or should he disagree about it? The next day, cook him another turkey and pack your trunk while he is eating. She says, there's nothing on earth so savage except a bear robbed of her cubs as a hungry husband. Um, and if you want to take advantage of him, a man that is full on food is very easy to take advantage of. But there's also a man that's hungry. There's nothing more savage. Um, and so... She says that learn a lesson from that. Keep him fed and languid. Live yourself on a low diet and cultivate your thinking powers and you'll be as spry as a cricket and hop over all the objections and remonstrances that his dead and alive energies can muster. Feed him well and he will stay contentedly in his cage like a gorged anaconda. So multiple times throughout this very short text, she presents men as animals. You know, the anaconda, um, the savage, 
uh, she talks about um, she talks about how uh, the angriest man with a full stomach uh, will stay content and will give you whatever you ask of him. Um, and so I think that that is an in, that's a funny funny text, and um, I think that's uh, very humorous, but also very um, very interesting viewpoint of a um, man. Let's take a look at male criticism on ladies' books. And I love this text. I think that it is um, it is critical. And at the same time, she approaches it with creative humor. And so it starts out with this quote from the New York Times, which is kind of where the offense started. She says, courtship and marriage, servants and children... She doesn't say this. I'm sorry. This is the quote from the New York Times. Courtship and marriage, servants and children, these are the great objects of a woman of woman's thought a woman's thoughts, and they necessarily form the staple topics of their writings and their conversation. We have hold on one second. Let's go to sleep. Um, we have no right to expect anything else in a woman's book. And as a woman myself, um, you, I, I feel the kind of the, the heat of that statement. Are are women only supposed to stay in the kitchen and think about cooking and sewing and worrying about households? You know, can they that? <laughs> That is not, uh, no longer, especially today, that's no longer the domain of a woman anymore. Um, yes, there are still women that are homemakers and, and, and make their lives in the home, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, the key is, is it's now a choice. It, it wasn't a choice in, in the past. It's now a choice that women can make. Do they want to pursue a life? outside of the home and that's okay we can't judge people like that and we can't judge the ones that want to stay behind in the home but that is not uh all that women are good for and that's what she's discussing here in this text um in that epigraph she says i just want to bring um oh no, i said i'm sorry i'm looking at my text notes and trying to formulate sentence sentence says um she says would a novel be a novel if it did not treat of courtship and marriage and if so could be recognized would it find readers when i see such a narrow snarling criticism as the above i always say to myself the writer is some unhappy man and she goes on to say who knows as much about reviewing a woman's book as i do about navigating a ship or engineering an omnibus from the south ferry through broadway to union park um she says and i I just want to point out if you think back to 102 when we read that drama trifles those men you know they were they were discussing the women folk and how they worried over the trifles um the cooking and the the jams and setting up the jams and doing the sewing and they dismissed the women to those regulatory roles and this is very much kind of like in those same veins where you have men dismissing women uh, that women can't write about anything else other than things of the home, courtship and marriage, servants and children. That's all we think about and that's all that we write about and, and have conversations about. And that is obviously not the case. I love this. She says, I think I see him writing that paragraph in a fit of spleen, of male spleen, in his small boarding house upper chamber by the cheerful light of a solitary candle flickering alternately on cobweb walls, dusty washstand, begrimed bowl and pitcher, refuse cigar stumps, boot jacks, old hats, buttonless coats, muddy trousers, and all the wretched, wretched accompaniments of solitary, selfish male existence. Not to speak of his own puckered, unkissable face. Perhaps, in addition, his boots hurt, his cravat bow persists in slipping under his ear for one of a pen and a wife to pin it, poor wretch. Or he has been refused by some pretty girl, as he deserved to be, narrow-minded old vinegar cruet. Or snubbed by some lady authoress. Or more trying than all to the male con constitution, has had a weak cup of coffee for that morning's breakfast. I love this, um... 
I love this, obviously, um, because she kind of turns their criticism of women on their head. So we have this snarling critic. He's an unhappy man. He's in an old, dirty, dusty room. It's filthy. It's full of cobwebs. He's selfish. He's alone. And he's unkissable with his ugly face. Um, she calls him a wretch and says that he's bitter because he doesn't have a woman in his life. He's been refused by a pretty girl. But her humorous exaggeration here kind of shows, uh, shows that men need women, both physically to keep them clean and keep the cobwebs out of their house, but also intellectually. She goes on to talk, however, that about it's not only rude for them to view women in this light, but it's also foolish because there's no point that men are more uh, intelligent. In fact, we've seen this already um, when we read... Um, uh, Lydia, um, Lord, my brain just stopped working. I had a brain, um, fart. It was due to Sergeant Murray when we talked about, um, on the equality of the sexes. We've seen, uh, this idea before that, uh, especially even before this time, that women um, weren't allowed the same educational opportunities as men. Therefore, they weren't able to reason or pass judgment as well as men can. But at this point in time, you know, we're talking about the 18th uh, century here. Um, you know, women are more educated. They are um, more intelligent and able to reason. And so... And she points out that if they were more intelligent, that they could go about criticizing female novels in a more intelligent manner. And she points that out here. She says that would it not be better and more manly to point out a better way, kindly, justly, and above all, respectfully, um, if you're so much more intelligent, uh, instead of using sneering criticism... How about pointing out our flaws kindly, justly, and respectfully? Um, and so I think that that is just very, um, very interesting and accurate. She says, we have had enough, we women. We have had quite enough of this shallow criticism on lady books. Um, and so I love that. Um, basically, what she's saying is, uh, that men are just jealous that she's more successful than they are.